My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors, and um, I am going to be preaching to you like this. I know this is terrible. It would have been so much easier for me to have been live in person with you. I was all excited to be with you, but I tested uh, positive for COVID-19 this week, and while I feel fine, um, I, I just don't want to infect anyone. So um, I was preparing this week, and the word that God gave me was, don't get distracted. <laughs> don't get distracted. It would have been so much more captivating to you if I was there in person. And, and he says, look, look at me, look at me. Don't get distracted. We're, doing, um, we're finishing our series in Ordinary People. How God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things if we don't get distracted. Because distraction is the enemy of finishing well. Distraction is the enemy of productivity. And, and, and God can use us mightily and powerfully. He's given each one of you an assignment to complete, to finish. He doesn't want you to get distracted. He's given each one of us a race to run and, 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 a, and a job to do, but He doesn't want us to get distracted. So I want to speak to you today. Don't get distracted. From Luke chapter 2, if you have a Bible, won't you turn there? We're going to look at the story of Simeon. Simeon was an older gentleman who remained focused throughout the course of his life, and he finished his task. He, he completed his assignment. He didn't get distracted. And so we're going to look at the life of Simeon. Let's read together from verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what, in, what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves of two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was a righteous and devout man. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Let me just pause there. It's amazing how the custom of the law required this. Joseph and Mary are, are, are God-fearing parents wanting to obey God's word. And so they take the child to, to, to be circumcised on the eighth day like the law required, like the Bible required. And, and the Holy Spirit is simultaneously moving Simeon so that they have this rendezvous. Isn't it amazing how the Spirit of God leads in the same way that the Word of God leads? It's almost as if this text is telling us right from the start, you're going to need the Spirit of God, all of the Spirit of God and all of the Word of God this year to get to where God wants you to go stay focused on his word and listen to his Holy Spirit. Okay, verse 28. Simon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. This brother is focused. You know somebody's focused when they know what their task is and they know when they've achieved their task and they are now ready to, to go and be with Jesus. He's saying, listen, I've done what you called me to do. You can take me home in peace. This guy has been focused for many years and now he knows that he's run his race. He's achieved his task. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, God's heart for diversity is right there. And the glory of all your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I want to pray, Spirit of the living God, won't you fall fresh on every person gathered here today. We haven't come simply for fellowship with each other. We've come for fellowship with you. Won't you speak now by your Holy Spirit? Come and bring encouragement to us and bring a word that would keep us focused in 2022. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So first we have to deal with drift distractions. Drift distractions. I'm not talking about the racing mode 
like, like drifting when cars drift, which is a pleasant distraction. I'm talking about drift distractions, that phenomenon of, of, of once being focused on something, but then slowly drifting away from what you were once focused on. I'm calling that drift distractions. It's, it's those small, imperceptible, little, tiny, not big distractions, tiny distractions that happen over time that cause us to drift away from what we are supposed to be focused on. It's like a, a tap that drips. It's imperceptible. It, 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 it doesn't seem like it's very much. We just bought a place and we've just moved in to this place um, over the holidays. And my wife has eagle eyes. And she spotted a tap that was dripping. Nobody else spotted it. She spotted this tap that was dripping ever so slightly. Just a little drip here and there. If you don't close the tap really hard, the tap drips. I didn't spot it. And so she spotted this tap. And, and she had a suspicion that other taps were also dripping. So she came up with a, with a test. She's got a little bucket. She puts the bucket underneath all of the taps. And, uh, and, the, and, and we found out the next day that there was, there was water in some of the other buckets. So a few of the other taps are also leaking there's a little drip under now a little drip doesn't seem like much it's it's imperceptible it seems small but when you put it all together we're losing quite a lot of water and and those little drips can become um, a little 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 uh, more consistent and 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 then after becoming a little more consistent become a little tweak of water and and after a while it can become a flowing tap and so after a while the the, the drip can start to lead to bigger bigger um, bigger drips bigger leaks and so you start losing things over time and so we need to really fix up the drip while we can. In David and Bathsheba, we know that story so well. That story would never have happened. The David and Bathsheba event, David would have never had the affair with Bathsheba. And then he ended up killing her husband, the Uriah the Hittite. That would never have happened if it wasn't for a drift distraction. If it wasn't for a little drip. And, and there's, a, there's a little clue right at the start of the story in verse 1. It says this, in the spring... At the time when kings went off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's army. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, was David a king? Yes, David was a king. Was it spring? Yes, it was spring. Was David supposed to go off to war with his army? Yes, he was supposed to go off to war with his army. Instead, David sent Joab out with the king's men. The, the distraction from the purposes of God, the distraction from God didn't happen when David had Uriah the Hittite killed. The distraction didn't happen when David saw Bathsheba bathing on a, on a rooftop. That's not when the main distraction happened. The main distraction, even though it was small, even though it was imperceptible, it happened when David didn't go off to war when kings were supposed to go off to war. Maybe that wasn't the first time he decided to stay home when he was supposed to go off to war. Maybe it was the third time. Maybe it was the second time. But there was this imperceptible little drip that became a bigger, a bigger leak. And, 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 and David started leaking the purposes of God. And it, one thing led to the next. And all of a sudden, we had a flowing tap. And David ends up uh, sleeping with Bathsheba and having, having her husband killed. Drift distractions work this way. They're small, they're imperceptible. They, they don't seem like they're very serious, but they lead to great drift over time. What I love about Simeon is that he didn't drift. He didn't drift away from the purposes of God. Verse 25 tells us that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. He was wait- Time can cause us to get closer to our destiny. The passage of time can cause us to get closer to what God wants for us or it can cause us to to drift away from it. The proverb writer puts it this. He says, Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Give careful thought to your to, to, to your ways. Give careful thought to the path that's before you. It's almost like he's giving us a picture of someone on a on a on a 10-day hike. On a 10-day hike, if you go off course, if you're not careful, right at the start, let's say you, day two, you go off just a few degrees from the, from the path. By day four, you're a couple, of, a couple of kilometers. One or two degrees on day one or two means a couple of kilometers on day five or six means that you don't get to your de- destination by day 10. And so the drift leads us over time further and further away from our destiny. The option before us is destiny or drift. That's the option. Which will we choose? The proverb writer says, be careful. Even the smallest of missteps along the way 
can cause you to veer off the path that God has for you to your destiny. God wants to keep you on the path. Be careful. So one of the questions that I ask myself constantly at the start of every year and then throughout the year, I ask this question, am I growing spiritually? Did I grow spiritually last year? I want to check that I'm still on the path. I want to make sure that I haven't drifted off the path. Am I still reading the Bible regularly? Am I still praying regularly? Am, am, I, am, I, am, I, am I more gentle this year? Am I more kind this year? Am I more generous? Am I growing in generosity? Am I, am I sinning less? These are all small and imperceptible things. I want to make sure that I'm not drifting. I want to do it. And, and I want to make sure that if I do spot any drift in myself, I want to get back onto the path immediately. If you get to day three of the, of the 10 day hike and you realize on day three, man, we're, we, we've been off course. We, we've, we went out a couple of degrees. What do you do? You get back to the, to the path immediately. Why do you go back immediately? Because every day that you wait takes you further and further away from God's destination for your life. Get back up to the path immediately. Even if right now you ask the question, am I growing spiritually? And you, and you discover, man, last year was a bad year. I didn't grow spiritually. Even if you discover, man, there was a time in my life when I wouldn't wait two or three weeks before I went to church. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had two or three weeks go past and I'm not in church. I get back to the path immediately. Get back to the path immediately. Even if you discover, man, I'm not, I'm not as gentle as I used to be in my words. If you discover that now, get back to the path immediately. Even if you discover, man, I, like I used, to be, I used to be reading the word regularly. I used to be praying regularly. I, I used to fast. Get back to the path immediately. Every day that you wait takes you further and further away from God's purposes for your life. Get back to the path immediately. This is a call to get back to the path. This is a call at the start of the year to make sure that you're on the path. Make sure in 2022 that we're going to start this year by not drifting away. We're going to start this year on um, our path that God has for us. So number one, uh, drift distractions. Number two, emotional distractions. Emotions are great servants. They, they, they're great indicators. They're terrible masters. They, they, they're meant to, to indicate stuff to us about, about our surroundings, about what's going on. They're not meant to master us. They're not meant to control us. My emotions are so fickle. If I gave my emotions control, decision-making, executive authority, I'd be all over the place. When I'm tired, I'm so emotional. If I'm tired and you show me a picture of a little kitten, I'd probably start tearing up. Oh, it's so cute, right? My emotions are all over the place. It's fickle. My emotions um, can be influenced by whether or not I've had coffee at the start of the day. You're not going to get me too excited before cappuccino. So, so our emotions are fickle. Simeon had emotions, but he wasn't controlled by his emotions. Listen to it, verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. I think there were days when Simeon's heart said to him, man, you're never going to see the Lord's Messiah. You were young and you were waiting on the Lord's Messiah. Now you are old and you are still waiting on the Lord's Messiah. Year after year, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing. Nothing has happened. Nothing has come of it. You've invested all this time. You've invested all this energy and nothing has come of it. It's been a fantasy. You should just give up. Stop waiting on the Lord's Messiah. I think that's what his heart said to him. And even though Simeon had emotions, he didn't give his emotions full control. He gave the last word to the Holy Spirit. The, his emotions said, you will not, you will not, you will not. I wonder what your emotions are saying to you at the start of this year. You will not, you will not. You can't. It won't happen. When your emotions are in disagreement with the Holy Spirit, tell your emotions to be quiet. The last word goes to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, you will. You will. You will see the Lord's Messiah. It will happen for you. And Simeon gives way to the Holy Spirit. Uh, he, he doesn't allow his, uh, his, his emotions to be the master. He, he says his emotions are the indicators. His emotions are not the drivers. Christ is the driver. Get out of the driver's seat emotions. I remember when I was a kid, um, we were we, we had this, uh, with, some with some friends and we discovered that there were what we thought was abandoned trail, uh, a railway line. So we stopped playing on the railway line. We're walking around. We, and we're playing. And then uh, as we're walking, I just hear the sound. Uh, from behind me going chick, 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 chick. and I, and I turn around and I'm thinking oh my goodness there's a train coming so I start so I start running chick, 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 because now um, we're so far ahead 
on this on this uh, what we thought was an abandoned railway line uh, we're hemmed in by some fences on either side and I hear the sound again and I'm like oh goodness it's getting closer the sound is getting louder so I start I start running a bit faster now the panic kicks in so I'm like I'm like running I'm hauling fast I'm just but the sound is just getting like louder and faster and, this, and I keep running faster and faster and then the sound is like super loud and super strong and fast and I'm like oh my goodness the only way I can escape my impending doom is if I just dive kind of off on the side of the rails and maybe the, the side of the train will just pass over my head and even though there's stones I can hear the sound and I'm like okay I'm going to dive and I dive and, uh, and the sound stops and I think to myself I kind of look around as I'm lying over there I'm like, oh, goodness, that happened really quickly. The train hit me. I died. I didn't even feel it. Uh, I must be in heaven, but uh, this doesn't look like heaven. So I stand up, and as I stand up, I start cleaning myself, and I hear the sound shh, 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 again, but much slower. And uh, I hit my pocket, and, and, I, and I hear the sound. Shh, shh, and I realize there's, there's, there's a noise shh, shh, coming from my pocket, and I put my hand in my pocket, shh, 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 and I realize there's a whole pocket full of coins and that was the sound. The shaking was just coins in my pocket. Listen, if you and I give our emotions control, we are going to end up being overwhelmed and scared and fearful by coins in our pockets thinking it's a train. If we give our emotions control, we're going to end up misreading situations and being fearful in a way that we're not supposed to. Someone once said, that type of fear is false evidence appearing real. We're going to think, oh my goodness, this person is against me, but it's going to be false evidence appearing real. We're going to think, oh my goodness, the, the country, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all doom and gloom. It's going to be false evidence appearing real. We're going to hit situations in our health or in our family, and it's going to be false evidence appearing real. There are going to be all kinds of things that happen. And if we give our emotions control, if our emotions are in the driving seat, we're going to be all over the place. We'll experience We'll be experiencing overwhelming feelings of fear or overwhelming feelings of anxiety and, and all sorts of runaway emotions. Remember the story of when, when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and, and he saw Jesus literally walking on water and he said to Jesus, if it's you, I'll come to you. And, and Jesus says, come to me. And Peter gets out of the boat and Peter starts walking on water and he's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. And as long as he's got his eyes fixed on Jesus, he walks on the water until the Bible says when he saw the wind, he was afraid. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. He had obviously taken his eyes off from Jesus and put it onto the wind and the waves. And he saw this wind welling up, massive swell. And he started to see the storm and his runaway emotions took control. And he became afraid and started to sink I wonder, where is your focus at the beginning of 2022? Because if it's not on Jesus, you're going to sink. If your focus is on anything except Jesus, what, what, if, if the wind and the waves is the economy, if the wind and the waves are your kids, if the wind and the waves are the, the family drama that happened over Christmas, it's going to be overwhelming for you and you're going to end up sinking. He's calling us to put our eyes on Him so that we don't freak out, so that we don't lose our way and allow our emotions to take control. Where is your focus in 2022? Sometimes a breakup can be all-consuming. Maybe you've gone through a breakup. Maybe your focus is on a relationship that's gone wrong. Perhaps your anxiety is on the work that you have to do at the start of this year. Perhaps your anxiety is, is coming from a family situation. Where's your focus? Sometimes it's not heart aches. It's not aches of the heart that consume us. Sometimes it's lusts of the heart that consume us. Have you ever seen a man trade in everything for an adulterous relationship? Trade in the company that they've worked for? Trade in the, the, their, their wife? Let go of their family? Say goodbye to the kids that they love? So that they can obey their emotions that say to them, you must have her. You won't be happy unless you have her. Have you seen that happen? Hmm? Have you ever seen a young professional trade in everything, sacrifice everything for, for, for uh, career success? We even, uh, we even hear people say stuff like, I, I don't want to get married because of my career. 
I don't want to have kids. Why? Because of my career. I, 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 I couldn't see my parents this year. Why? Because of work. We, 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 friend, beloved, if, if your emotions are master, you will sacrifice everything that you love, including yourself, to achieve your emotional happiness. And it's and not going to fulfill you. It's not going to fulfill you. If Christ is the master, the one who sacrificed himself to make you right with God, to make you right with others, to make you right with yourself, you will reach your destination. You will reach your destiny if Christ is the master. If your emotions are master, it will tell you you're right when you are wrong. If emotions are master, it will say you can have this even when you're not supposed to have it. When emotions are master, it says to you, you can't break through. You're going to be fearful. This will never change. When it will change. But Christ alone is the true north. Christ alone is, 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 the, is the working moral compass. Christ alone is the bright morning star, the one that, that we can follow. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we come to the Father through Christ. Christ alone is the anchor for our souls. Is Christ the master? Is Christ in the driving seat? Or is your emotions? So firstly, Drift distractions. Secondly, emotional distractions. And then lastly, disappointment distractions. Staying focused on Jesus leads invariably to disappointment. Invariably, it leads to disappointment. Why do I say that? I say that because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We are, are sinful. He is pure. There's going to be a clash over there. He stands outside of time. He stands outside of time. We're limited, but, he, but he's not limited. He goes outside of time. I need this to happen in 2022 so that this can happen in 2023 so that it leads to that in 2024. And so we are confounded by his ways. He's 10,000 steps ahead of us. And so there's bound to be times when his will and our expectations clash and it leads to disappointment. And Simeon tells Mary, that she must not allow disappointment to distract her. Jesus will disappoint people, and even Mary's own disappointment will be tied up to Jesus. Listen to it. He says in verse 34, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And so in the life of Jesus, many were disappointed by Jesus. He equals the falling of many. He revealed the, heart, he revealed the hearts of many. And, and he was rejected by many. The rich young ruler rejected him. Why? Because he didn't agree with what Jesus had to say about money. And still, the call to generosity, the call to care for the poor, the call to give sacrificially to the church remains hard. The, 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 the Pharisees couldn't stand Jesus. In his own hometown in Nazareth, they almost killed him because of his emphasis on diversity. He said that the kingdom belonged to the Gentiles as much as it belonged to the Jews. They wouldn't have it, and they almost killed him for it. And sadly, Sundays, Sunday mornings remains one of the most divided times of the week. Praise God, not in this church, not in this house. This house is a house for everyone. Everyone belongs over here. But, but, but people struggled with what he had to say. People, people fell away from him because of his ethics. People fell away from him because of what he taught. The Pharisees at one time, they, in many times actually, they struggled with what he had to teach about grace. They wanted man-made religion. They wanted man-made religion. They didn't want grace. They, they, they wanted law. And... and, and and man-made religion remains all the rage. That man-made religion is as hot as it's ever been. There are many who still prefer man-made religion because it doesn't require an acknowledgement of sin. It doesn't require a humble desire for God's grace towards us. The message of Jesus was very simple in one regard. It, it, it was, you're a sinner in need of saving. And, and they found it offensive. The disappointment of offense settled. And still today, some would say, man, that's a horrible message. That's a hurtful message, calling people sinners, calling people to repentance. It's, it's, it's hurtful. Beloved, it's, it's actually more helpful than it is hurtful if you're able to not give way to the disappointment of offense. It's actually more, more helpful. I say to some of my doctor friends all the time that doctors 
hurt people to help people. That's why I could never be a doctor. I could never hurt someone to help them. Right? I could never take that scalpel and cut through someone's body to get to the cancer. I could never hurt somebody to help them. I could never even look somebody in the eye and say to them, you've got cancer. Say stuff that's hard for people to hear. I, I, you know, I don't, but that's what a great physician does. That's what the great physician has done. He says there's a cancer. There's sin. You need saving. You need rescuing. He says things that are sometimes hurtful, that sometimes are offensive to us. He reveals things in our own hearts that are, that are hard for us to, 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 uh, to, 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 to get to terms with. And he says, I, I can save you. I can heal you. I can help you. It requires humility. It requires coming before me. It's more helpful than it is hurtful if we're able to not give way to the offense of it all. And I think the sword that is uh, being described in verse 35, the sword that will pierce Mary's soul, the actual word there is, is, is for a big sword. So there's a big sword that's going to pierce Mary's soul. I think this is a, a big event. And I think what the big event is describing, I'm not sure, but I think it's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. I think that was the big event, the sword that hurt Mary's soul. I mean, imagine seeing your own son being crucified and knowing that was God's will. Imagine seeing your son dying, being tortured in front of you and knowing this is God's will. I mean, Mary, the anguish of it all, saying to herself, how could you have let this happen, God? How can this be your will? In the prime of his life, I have to watch him being tortured, my son, Jesus, dying. She couldn't have known that the hurt was there actually to help her. She couldn't have fully comprehended that his crucifixion was her salvation. Sometimes the hand that seems against us, the hand that seems against you, the hand of the physician, of the physician that seems to be harming you, is helping you. Sometimes the sword that seems to be penetrating the soul and hurting is actually removing the cancer. Don't resist the sword. Don't resist the hand of the physician. In 2022, will you do life God's way? Will you, will you do relationships God's way? In 2022, will you do sex God's way? Will you do money God's way? Will you do life God's way? Will you do church God's way? Will 2022 be the year where we say no to distractions and we say yes to being focused on Christ, not resisting what he wants for us, not being offended by what he wants for us, but going along with what he has for us. I want to close off with a quote from C.S. Lewis. And um, it's an interesting quote because he describes our distractions like an ache in the soul, an ache in the soul. And, uh, and listen to it. I'll give him the last word. He's saying to us that the ache in the soul, the distractions are all pointing us somewhere. I'll give him the last word. Apparently then, our lifelong nostalgia our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fantasy but the truest index of our real situation. And to be at last summoned inside would be both glory and honor beyond all our merits and also the healing of that old ache.